Welcome. Before we begin, we have closed captioning for this event. If you would like that, please go to the button at the right bottom hand uh, of your Zoom screen. It should say live transcript with a CC on it. Please click on that and then select uh, start subtitle and you should have closed captioning. Excellencies, uh, delegates, distinguished guests, a very good morning from New York. I'm Shakuntala Santaran. Uh, a very warm welcome to this special online event to mark the sixth annual World Tsunami Awareness Day. In the words of the UN Secretary General Science and International Cooperation, together with a preparedness and early action, must be at the heart of our efforts to save lives from tsunamis and other hazards. Our chosen theme for World Tsunami Day uh, this year is uh, leveraging the power of science and technology uh, to reduce a tsunami risk uh, and uh, for current and future generations. We'll be hearing a lot about a tsunami program being included in the UN Ocean Decade of Science uh, for Sustainable Development and what that means for tsunami vulnerable communities around the world. We are honored to have video messages from His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly, and the Honorable Mr. Miyake Shingo, who is Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. We're also pleased to have live remarks from Her Excellency, Dr. Fiona Webster, co-chair of the Group of Friends for Disaster Risk Reduction and Deputy Permanent Representative of Australia to the United Nations. Our distinguished lineup of speakers also includes the Secretary General's Special Representative for Disaster Risk Reduction, Ms. Mami Mitsutori, and the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, Dr. Vladimir Ryabinin. We will also hear from representatives uh, from countries living on the front line of tsunami risks that have suffered uh, many tragedies in the past. Today's event is co-hosted by the permanent missions of Japan, Fiji, uh, Maldives, and Chile, countries united in their common experience of tsunamis in the past. Uh, the co-chairs of the Group of Friends of Disaster Risk Reduction, the Permanent Missions of Australia, uh, Norway, Peru, and Indonesia, as well as the UNDP and UNESCO are also co-hosting this event. Now, World Tsunami Awareness Day is the brainchild of Japan, which has suffered many tsunamis in the past, including the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. I was actually in Kyoto at the time, living there at the time, and was rushed to Tokyo to report on uh, the tsunami and uh, the devastating loss of life in such a short amount of time. And then the nuclear emergency that happened right after with the nuclear Fukushima power plant being uh, destroyed or damaged by the tsunami, highlighting against the immense destructive force of tsunamis. We would like to begin our event today uh, sharing the story of a young girl in Chile whose quick action helped to save many lives. Here's her story.
Si ese día había salido. Había estado con mis amigas, con mi amigo y... Nos sentábamos a ver la luna porque estaba la luna súper grande. Todo muy oscuro, todo muy brilloso por la luna. Que me fui para la casa, mis papás estaban viendo el festival. Y yo, chao, me fui a acostar. Y en eso, cuando me estoy quedando dormida, Me levanto y le digo, sí, mamá, si es que está temblando la pieza. Y me dice, es que te están las almas malas, te están como penando, y que te contáis tan mal. Y yo dije, ah, no. Ya no sé, dos minutos, tenemos una llamada. Y mi mamá se levanta súper rápido, le escucha así como, ¿aló? ¿Papá? ¿Qué pasó? Me dice, Martina, tu abuelo me está contando que hubo un terremoto enorme en Valparaíso. Pusimos como la tele a ver si salía algo. Obviamente no había nada, está todo caído. Y en eso es cuando empezamos a sentir como un ruido. Mira como cuando está en la orilla de la playa y el mar se recoge para hacer una ola, pero intensifica algo así por mil. Mi papá se va para donde la capitanía puerto. Yo se dice, váyanse por el camino del Cabrera para arriba y ahí ya deberían estar seguros. Y cuando estaba corriendo, mi mamá no corría. Pero si mamá corre, mamá corre. Yo pensé ser mis seres queridos. Mi... Lo único que tenía en ese momento para poder llegar a ellos era tocando el con. Y yo digo, no, o sea, yo no me voy a ir a donde Cabrera, yo voy a ir a tocar el con. No iba con zapatos, me enterré un clavo en el pie. Al principio no encontraba el mazo que era para pegarle al Goni. Realmente como que de película se iluminó. Y lo agarré y empecé a pegarle, a pegarle, a pegarle. Perdí todo el ambiente. una persona está pasando ya en ese punto íbamos gritando levántense despiértense hay un tsunami empezamos a despertar a la gente y qué pasó ¿Qué está pasando tenemos que correr ahora ya no podía prácticamente ni respirar y estaba dando un principio de ataque de asma y el mar ya estaba ahí que teníamos que correr sí o sí fue primero como la subida de mar Después fue esta ola y después ya cuando se recogió el mar así, completo, completo. Que esa, que esa fue la que dejó todo el pueblo abajo. Llegamos a, literal, la punta del cerro. Nosotros habíamos dado por perdido a mi papá. Y en un momento, mi papá apareció. Y subió con nuestra perrita que teníamos. Lo vimos, lo abrazamos. Mi papá destruido, en roto. Le dice a mi mamá, no hay nada que hacer, está todo destruido.
todavía no éramos conscientes de toda la gente que se había salvado. Martina's uh, quick thinking really saved many lives and drove home uh, the importance of early warning action. I would now like to call uh, your attention to opening remarks uh, from His Excellency, uh, Dr. Abdullah, rather Mr. Abdullah Shahid, who's president of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the discussion on World Tsunami Awareness Day. I commend the permanent mission of Japan, as well as the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction for leading on this campaign. I would also like to recognize the leadership of Japan in ensuring that this issue remains on the international radar. Dear friends, I know all too well the horrors of a tsunami. The Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 echoed across our entire region, taking hundreds of thousands of lives and devastating countries and communities in the process. As I said at the recent high-level thematic debate on delivering climate action, there is always hope when we have the capacity for action, for change, and for results. When it comes to tsunamis, we already have the technologies and capabilities. We have the early warning systems. We have emergency measures that have proven effective. We have reliable evacuation and shelter systems. We have technology for resilient infrastructure. But more needs to be done to reach all these to those at risk. Investment in DRR and technology transfer needs to be directed where it matters most to ensure that at-risk countries, such as small island states and the least developed countries, are better supported. Reducing tsunami risk for current and future generations requires that we put to use the incredible innovations in science and technology that are at our disposal. And we must back this with governance systems supported by funding that recognize the magnitude of the risk and respond accordingly. This requires legislation, budgeting, and concrete means of implementation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to see this year's emphasis on youth in raising tsunami awareness. I have made youth a priority of the 76th session, the Presidency of Hope, and I've already announced a youth fellowship program in line with this. I encourage UNDRR and all actors engaged in disaster risk reduction to involve youth in decision-making processes and to empower them to protect themselves and their communities. Allow me to point to the ongoing recovery from COVID-19 as an opportunity to strengthen our commitment to disaster risk reduction through a sustainable recovery that is greener, bluer, more sustainable, and more resilient, we can build a better world, a world that is guided by the 2030 Agenda, by the Paris Agreement, and of course, by the Sendai Framework. As we proceed through the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and as the world attends COP26 and discusses resilience, there is no better time to invest in risk reduction prevention and preparedness. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Shahid. We now have an opening message from the Honorable Mr. Miyake Shingo, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. guests and participants from all over the world, I am Miyake Shingo, 
Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs. It is a great honor to participate in this online event, marking World Tsunami Awareness Day 2021, and to make a few remarks on behalf of the government of Japan. Before I begin, I wish to express my sincere appreciation to Ms. Mizutori Mami, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and Head of UNDRR. I would also like to thank all other fellow member states and relevant UN agencies for their efforts in bring, bringing us together to discuss how we can enhance international cooperation in re reducing tsunami risks. The main topic of today's online event is leveraging the power of science and technology to reduce tsunami risk. The role of science and technology is extremely significant in raising public awareness of and preparing effective measures in advance against the risk of tsunami. It is essential that we strengthen policy making based on scientific knowledge. For instance, analysis of past disasters and the mechanism that generates tsunami will enable us to estimate the wave height and area to be impacted by tsunami that may be caused by a large scale earthquake in the future. Upgrading of tsunami forecast will facilitate future investment in disaster risk reduction. Japan has taken the lead in effort to make the international community more resilient by utilizing lessons learned and technology gained through the history of natural disasters that took place in the past. For example, a seawall constructed with Japan Official Development Assistance saved the capital city of the Maldives from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Japan has also assisted in the installment of a tsunami early warning system in the Indian Ocean through UNESCO. Our recent technical cooperation projects include improving tsunami alert systems in Indonesia and Vanuatu, as well as tsunami modeling based on the latest seabed observation and data analysis technology in Mexico, just to name a few. In order to maximize the effectiveness of these activities based on scientific evidence, it is vital to raise awareness of tsunami, especially among younger generations. This is one reason why Japan strongly advocated the establishment of World Tsunami Awareness Day in 2015. It is our sincere hope to promote greater understanding of tsunami so that it becomes common practice for as many people as possible to immediately evacuate sensitive areas once an earthquake hits. In the same way, Japan has assisted school education on tsunami risk reduction and evacuation drills in the Asian Pacific in cooperation with UNDP. More than 100,000 teachers and children have joined the program since 2017. Furthermore, Japan has been offering a study course on tsunami risk reduction for women leaders of small island developing states through UNITER. This year marks a decade since the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011. It is our responsibility to ensure that we never let the memory of this sad event fade and to pass down the grim lessons we learned for posterity. We must continue our effort to build a disaster resilient and sustainable society for the future of our children and our grandchildren. We cannot escape the hazards of tsunami, but we can minimize the damage they cause 
by drawing on the knowledge we have gained to date and redoubling our effort to reduce the danger. Japan, as a disaster-prone country, is committed to contributing to building resilience, sustainable development, and human securities around the world by sharing its knowledge and best practice with other countries. In conclusion, I wish to express my sincere hope that today's online event will be a valuable opportunity to facilitate further international cooperation in tackling tsunami and to raise awareness of the necessity to reduce the risk they pose, especially among future generations. Let us join forces to realize a world where no one is left behind by disasters. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mr. Miyake Shingo. And recognizing once more the commitment and leadership of Japan in promoting uh, a disaster, a culture of disaster risk reduction around the world and also uh, Japan's generosity in supporting developing countries. Uh, I'd now like to invite Her Excellency, Dr. Fiona Webster, Deputy Permanent Representative of Australia to the United Nations to deliver a statement on behalf of the co-chairs of the Group of Friends for Disaster Risk Reduction, Australia, Indonesia, Norway, and Peru. Ambassador Dr. Webster, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Hakintala. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here delivering an open, opening statement today as one of the co-chairs, as you say, of the Group of Friends of Disaster Risk Reduction in New York. The theme of today's event is extremely timely, of course, as members meet in Glasgow at COP26. We know that science and technology are key to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, tackling climate change and building resilient societies. Disasters can, as we know, suddenly or gradually impact on essential services, erode assets and increase inequality and poverty. At the same time, we face complex and systemic challenges in addressing COVID-19, as well as climate change and conflict-related challenges. As the DRR Global Blueprint, the Sendai Framework outlines, we are in a new era of disaster risk management, needing to broaden our focus from managing emergencies to managing disaster risks, and from thinking about individual hazards to thinking about interdependent systems. Better understanding future systemic risks will improve our preparedness, our disaster and climate resilience, and inform cost-effective anticipatory and early action. This event is a wonderful opportunity to showcase the skills and expertise of young people working in science and technology. The innovative risk reduction solutions developed by young professionals can help ensure policy and investment decisions do not create new risks for future generations. An influential example is Indonesia's interdisciplinary earthquake scientist, Dr. Nurani Rama Hanifa, who received last month the Rising Star Award from the Women's International Network for Disaster Risk Reduction. Dr. Hanifa founded You Inspire, bringing young professionals in science, engineering and technology from across 12 countries together with governments and the UN to build capacity and develop DRR knowledge products. I take this opportunity to echo as well the call made by the President of the General Assembly for increased investments in science and technology to build resilience and reduce risk in the least developed countries and small island developing states. Indeed, resilience building and risk reduction must be a guiding principle of the new Doha program of action for the LDCs. This is a key issue for our region in Australia. In the Pacific, 90% of Pacific Islanders outside of Papua New Guinea live less than five kilometres from the ocean and close to half live at low elevations, 
making them highly vulnerable to tsunamis and to storm surge. Australia's international disaster risk reduction efforts focus on disaster and climate resilient infrastructure, ensuring all voices are heard and can strengthen DRR efforts and exploring new ways of generating and delivering disaster risk financing. The group of Friends for DRR in turn is committed to integrating disaster risk reduction and promoting synergies with the implementation of the Sendai framework across the agenda in New York. This includes through the Commission on the Status of Women, the Forum on Financing for Development, and the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. We hope to see tangible recommendations and demonstrations of best practice from country reviews and the global and regional DRR platforms as we work together to further embed risk reduction into economic, development, climate and humanitarian policy. On behalf of the co-chairs, we look forward to working with you to ensure the 2023 midterm review is a success. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Dr. Webster. I now have the pleasure to invite uh, Ms. Mami Mitsutori, who's a special representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and head of the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, Ms. Mitsutori, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Shaq. Good morning. I would like to, at the outset, thank the co-organizers of this event, the permanent missions of Australia, Chile, Fiji, Indonesia, Japan, Maldives, Norway, and Peru, as well as UNDP and UNESCO. And I also thank the president of the General Assembly for sending his important message to this event. Earlier this year, as we have been hearing, we marked the 10th anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. It was a solemn day of remembrance for the 18,400 people who died or are still missing because of that catastrophe. It also brought home the importance of preserving our memories of such experiences because as painful as they are, the lessons from these disasters should never be forgotten. Tsunamis remain the deadliest of all sudden onset natural hazards and they expose shortcomings in the built environment with fatal consequences. Tsunamis are the ultimate test for risk governance and the rigor of disaster risk reduction strategies when it comes to managing risks that originate in the world's oceans and threatens the coastlines where 650 million people are exposed to tsunami risk, storms and tidal surges. While rising sea levels and industrial pollution are all contributing to the expansion of the tsunami threat, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is encouraged by the progress we have seen since the celebration of the first World Tsunami Awareness Day five years ago. A growing number of communities in the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, and the territories of the Pacific and Indian Ocean have received the prestigious Tsunami Ready Certification of UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. Perhaps nowhere, nowhere epitomizes the enthusiasm for this program better than the India state of Odisha, which lost 10,000 people in a cyclone in 1999 and since has pursued a zero casualty policy through its state disaster management authority, including rolling out the Tsunami Ready program to over 300 coastal villages. Signs of the progress are everywhere, including ISO Tsunami Ready certification for the new airport in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, this is a world first. And most heartening of all is the work that is being done with the youth of climate vulnerable small island developing states in the Caribbean and across the Pacific. I'm excited to hear shortly from you on how you are investing energy and scientific learning into reducing disaster risk of your communities. Let me also applaud UNDP's School Tsunami Preparedness Project, which has trained so many students over so many years, supported from the government of Japan. And similarly, the UN SCAP Trust, Trust Fund for Tsunami Disaster and Climate Preparedness has supported the establishment of the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning and Mitigation System. Today, I'm offering you only a flavor of the great work has, which has been done to raise tsunami awareness across the globe. 
And I can say confidently that the establishment of today, 5th of November, as the World Tsunami Awareness Day has moved the needle so much towards tsunami awareness globally in a dramatic way. The UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction encourages the inclusion, where appropriate, of tsunami risk in national and local disaster risk reduction strategies as called for by the Sendai framework. And it is wonderful that the UNESCO IOC Assembly has decided to include a tsunami program in the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And today we will hear from my dear colleague, Dr. Vladimir Ryabinin, Executive Secretary of UNESCO IOC on this crucial initiative. In the words of the adopted resolution, under the safe ocean outcome of the ocean decade, we have a once in a generation opportunity to improve tsunami detection and early warning systems. UNDRR welcomes and fully supports the stated ambition of making 100% of all communities at risk to be prepared for and resilient to tsunami through the implementation of the UNESCO IOC Tsunami Ready Program and many other initiatives by 2030. Now, until COVID-19 arrived on the scene, we could have argued that it was a challenge to focus the mind of politicians and policymakers on even a powerful disaster like a devastating tsunami. But now, even each citizen in all UN member states understand what can happen if we ignore the science and evidence and allow disaster risks to ruin our lives and livelihoods. In closing, I would like to mention that my view is that a community that is tsunami ready is also ready for all other natural and man-made hazards that will threaten us in this age of climate emergencies, ecological breakdown and pandemics. So let us all be tsunami ready and build our resilience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mitsutori, for your opening remarks. Uh, the importance of having young people involved in disaster risk reduction is increasingly being uh, recognized and emphasized. We now have a, a collection of video messages from youth and young professionals engaged in such vital work uh, in many different parts of the world. I was a student at university in Jakarta when tsunami hitting the Indian Oceans in December 2004. The initial shock quickly turned into actions as my lecturer set up an emergency medical team. I experienced a huge earthquake, the emergency shelter, and the voluntary evacuation due to nuclear power plant accident. I was shocked to see my hometown destroyed by the tsunami. I strongly felt that such a painful experience should not be experienced by anyone again and I want to reduce the number of people who die in disasters. Youths of Tonga make up about one third of Tonga's total population. As such, it is important to educate youth to know a tsunami's nature warning signs and also what to do and how they can contribute when the government of Tonga issues a tsunami warning. Hello, I'm Mursa Fitra Lasibadi, 25 years old. I'm an executive director of the Sikola Mombine Foundation, Central Sulawesi, Indonesia. As survivors of the 2018 earthquake, tsunami, and liquefaction in Central Sulawesi, as well as women's activists, we understand that the involvement of women and other vulnerable groups in disaster mitigation and disaster risk reduction is very important. I am Yu Watanabe, a master's student at Tohoku University. I started my research on tsunamis after listening to a storyteller in the area affected by the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. In the future, I would like to contribute to empower more citizens to learn the lessons of past tsunamis and to become involved in disaster risk reduction. message pour plaidoyer l'accroissement du niveau de connaissance des risques de tsunami, surtout pour les jeunes vecteurs de changement. 
J'invite ainsi mes collègues scientifiques, les leaders dans la RRC, au sein des ONG ou associations locales ou nationales ou internationales, à multiplier leurs efforts afin que tous les jeunes seront informés du risque auquel ils font face. As mountain hazards will become more prominent due to climate change, contemporary conditions represent an urgent call for action for young professionals that, with their innovative perspectives, shall close the generational gap and engage in multi hazard matters. Cooperation is the only way to achieve resilience. Engaging youth in disaster risk reduction strategies, informing them about risks of the territory is important. And I would like to take the opportunity of the World Tsunami Awareness Day to reach out to the youth around the world and highlight the importance of prevention and DRR knowledge to become proactive citizens in our community. My name is Katarina Rayawa. I am 25 years old. I work for the Seismology Unit for the Mineral Resources Department under the Ministry of Lands and Mineral Resources. We will continue to strive to better our services in ensuring the safety of lives in Fiji. Happy World Tsunami Awareness Day! Now, in his uh, message today, the UN Secretary General said, and I quote, on World Tsunami Awareness Day, we call on countries, international bodies, and civil society to increase understanding about the threat and share innovative approaches to reduce risks. We can build on progress achieved, ranging from better outreach to tsunami exposed communities around the world to the inclusion of a tsunami program in the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. There is no person better qualified to give us insight into what this means than our keynote speaker today. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vladimir Ryabinin, who's Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. Dr. Ryabinin, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Shakuntala. You know, ladies uh, uh, and gentlemen, excellencies, all courtesies observed, I would like to thank uh, Japan, United Nations uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Office, the special representative, my friend, Mami Mitsutori. And, you know, and since uh, we started to discuss about this event, I see that there are many more countries joined as host uh, of that. So I, I really congratulate you on that and I thank all the countries. Uh, so also for inviting me to speak to you, this is a rare opportunity. Let's just move forward. You know, indeed, uh, like uh, our the, uh, convener already said, disasters uh, are, are different. Tsunamis are rare, but they are the deadliest uh, uh, sudden onset of natural hazards. Let me very briefly uh, inform you of the current state of the tsunami warning system. Now, uh, IUC started this in 1965 in the, uh, after tsunami in Chile uh, uh, that happened in, 2000, in, in 1960. And you know, right now we have a, a tsunami warning systems in the four parts of the world that are prone to uh, tsunamis that are generated by earthquakes. But you know, there are some other tsunamis that generate, may be generated by landslides. For example, in Alaska, there was a, a rock slide that uh, generated a mega tsunami, which was 524 meters high. So people died. So of course, uh, we also have uh, uh, tsunamis generated by volcanoes, including uh, uh, collapse of the uh, slopes of the volcanoes that was happening in Krakatau in Indonesia in 2018. And also there are some uh, slides that are happening underwater. They may uh, either trigger tsunami or increase tsunami. That apparently was also the case in the Palo also in Indonesia. So, uh, and also there are me meteor tsunamis. So there are different uh, types of tsunamis and how the system works that we have now. The system uh, uses seismic stations to detect uh, an earthquake. They 
then and it uh, uh, because of uh, different sources of data it identifies the location the depths uh, the magnitude uh, and then we do some geographic search and we understand what kind of uh, the motion there what what kind of uh, uh, displacement of water happened there and then with that we decide whether a tsunami warning should be triggered if it's triggered then um, it it has to be uh, determined where the tsunami will strike and then there is a call for evacuation and warning and then hopefully action takes place on the ground this is how all things work so I, are we protected uh, from the uh, tsunamis yes we are protected uh, um, somewhat in case of tsunamis that are generated by earthquakes uh, but if earthquakes happen close to the to the shore we are poorly protected just you know i would like to refer to the sad uh, experience of japan 2011 the hoko uh, which we uh, commemorated recently the the victims you know but also i would like to say that even in the best prepared country a uh, strong magnitude earthquake near to the shore can really create a disaster so you know there are some ways of minimizing the risk but you know even uh, but i'd like also to say that you know what we learn from that tsunami is also that courage of people responsibility of people responsibility of officials and also the noble character of people may help uh, really in in mitigating the disaster so in case of a near short tsunami the following rule i would like to everyone uh, remember waves in the solid matter for example in the earth they travel faster than the waves can travel on the surface of of, of the liquid of, of of water and because of that uh, uh, shock from the tsunami arrives before uh, from from the earthquake arrives before uh, tsunami waves and this gives us a chance to to run basically so if in the near shore area there is a, a tremor then it simply means that maybe an earthquake and then there is no time to to think about this we have to run to higher ground to save it. That's basically the rule that everyone needs to know. So, um, and uh, so we are protected, as already said, from uh, some seismic tsunami oriented tsunamis uh, in case uh, if they're not so uh, close to us, but we are not protected from the tsunamis that are not really uh, seismic that I also described to you. So I would like now to announce to you uh, our ambitious plans on upgrading the tsunami warning system. So what we can achieve uh, in the result of the actions of the United Nations system, people, uh, governments, is better detection of the earthquakes. And for that, we have uh, navigational satellites that can improve the quality. We can uh, also improve our knowledge of seismology in related risks, also related to climate. We can better detect now tsunami wave propagation because uh, we may use uh, certain buoys, we call dart buoys, also uh, some sensors uh, on the cables that uh, is a new development. And then we also have better computers, better models, and we hope to know the depths of the ocean with the resolution that is required to run those models well. And of course, warning dissemination in the era of communications, this uh, uh, capacities are totally different now. So we also hope uh, that the system will work better as in the intergovernmental system. We already have 11 uh, uh, tsunami service providers in the in the four regions, in the, uh, and we hope to increase their number, increase their capacity, increase their governmental support, and uh, we need to work better with the emergency agencies to communicate and ensure that agencies really know what needs to be done. So for that, we are improving standard operating procedures, uh, tsunami action plans. We also need to educate people about tsunami. We have four centers uh, that are providing information about tsunami, so-called tsunami information centers in the all regions that are prone to se seismic tsunamis. And of course, the critically important thing is the last mile. So people not only just are warned, but they should do what is really required. So basically you know this is a system this is highly technical but really intertwined with a massive societal uh, fabric uh, to to so that system could work so de definitely ic doesn't do it alone we do it with uh, partners under the leadership of uh, disaster risk reduction office uh, also with participation with wmo undp unescap and many uh, organizations that were already uh, presented uh, in, in in part of the, what they do today so uh, 
And of course, we need to adapt the system to the new uh, conditions, new life. You know, climate is changing. I am speaking uh, to you from Glasgow, from uh, the Conference of Parties 26, where critical decisions may be taken also in relation to the ocean. So, but you know, climate change is happening. Sea level is uh, rising and even modest increase in sea level may increase, uh, change the frequency, the change the statistical behavior of tsunamis leading to more extreme events. So, you know, we are living in more and more complex world. Only earth system science can really address this matter. So, but, you know, I would like also to say that, you know, our plans are ambitious, but, you know, they're very substantiated because the situation in the United Nations system, the world is changing positively towards the ocean. Now we have sustainable development goal 14 for the ocean. We have also the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which uh, you see proposed to the United Nations, and then it was proclaimed in 2017. And basically, the vision of that uh, decade is the following. The science we need for the ocean we want. We really outlined seven qualities of the ocean, including one which is called inspiring and engaging ocean. It's not really quality of the ocean, it's quality of people and their human relation with the ocean. But one of these uh, qualities is also safe ocean. And this is what we are going to descri describe in more details. So after the proclamation 2017 of the decade of ocean science, Three years were spent on the development of the implementation plan and those qualities of the ocean, also different challenges, including the climate challenge, disaster risk reduction challenge, observation, data challenge, they all were designed during that time. And we are now uh, having interest and expression of commitment of many, many countries. Uh, more than 20 uh, national committees exist uh, uh, for, for the decade, more are in, in making. We have 31, uh, major decade programs, which is probably the largest amount since the start of the history of ocean science. We were able to raise roughly a billion US dollars in all these activities. So starting from ground zero, I think we achieved important thing on material uh, development, but also engagement, understanding. So decade is basically a framework. This is a, a movement of, uh, of people, scientists together with governments, with uh, NGOs and ordinary people to, to move forward. So, you know, I also would like to say this is a science that is not really what you may imagine the ocean science is. You know, I'm a oceanographer and, and mathematician, but you know, this science is uh, really social. We have a decade of ocean empathy a decade of, uh, of uh, leadership of women in ocean science, a, de a decade in the network of uh, early career ocean professionals. So, you know, this is a totally different view when science informs, but, you know, the society really uh, lives with that and takes forward uh, uh, the, the good ideas that are generated by society and the scientists. So the engagement of, uh, um, of many partners made it possible for us to develop the concept of the new uh, generation of the tsunami warning system that is based on the previous tsunami warning system, but it will be much stronger. So indeed, technical uh, uh, things I've already described to you, they're quite complicated, they're, but they're quite feasible. But the most important element is that the system work that makes the system work is the societal reaction to this. And this brings me to the tsunami ready program. It, you know, this program started, uh, and you know, actually, I saw uh, that there was some chat and Krista Hildebrand Andrade was there. So she was also one of the proponents of the uh, tsunami ready system in the Caribbean. They started in the uh, 2010s, you know, it was just the start. It was modeled from the US system. And now we have uh, 14 communities in 11 countries in the Caribbean. Uh, we now have more and more uh, communities in the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean. Uh, soon uh, we're going to have them in the Mediterranean. And uh, so we are announcing uh, our unprecedented level of ambition and tsunami ready program. We would like to have all tsunami ready communities, uh, tsunami prone communities, announced as tsunami ready communities by the year 2030. So that's the level of ambition that I think the whole world needs. And what is happening and also, Mami Mizutori mentioned this in her uh, speech related to Adisha. If you are tsunami uh, ready, then you're also ready or better ready for other disasters. So for that, we need to identify the, uh, the tsunami uh, prone communities. We need to see what needs to be done, develop plans, prepare the community. It's huge work, but this is uh, the work that is going to save lives. So, you know, I would like to say that uh, we believe it's not just 
just, I would say, wishful thinking, because we already know that, for example, in the Caribbean, just before the uh, COVID pandemic, we uh, were able to, to, in the tsunami exercise, uh, engage 800 people who were created in a drill. So this is uh, this is possible, and we are not uh, we are going to do something that is really possible, despite it is really ambitious. And before I conclude, I would like really to say that under the decade, there is a special program uh, for early career ocean professionals. You know, I participated in several meetings with them. I would like to say they are wonderful. You know, we heard this wonderful people uh, in the in the just video before me, and there are thousands of wonderful people also working for the decade of ocean science. Basically, they need to meet and, you know, enrich each other. I would just invite you to federate with the big program of, for uh, early career ocean professionals in the, in, in, in the ocean decade. I think it will reach the decade and it will reach the tsunami ready communities. That's all I wanted to say. Our plans are noble. Uh, they are doable. We need your support. But I would like to conclude with one uh, quote. The quote is from the movie, which is called The Wave. If you haven't seen it, I, I just recommend. The quote reads as follows. It has happened before. It will happen again. So if we are together, we will be able to reduce the disasters risk coming from tsunamis. Thank you very much for attention and good luck. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Riavinen, for your information-packed uh, keynote address. Coming up, uh, we'll be joined live by an international panel of experts from the field. First, we have a video message from Ms. Vasiti Soko, who is the director of Fiji's National Disaster Management Office. Chief of the United Nations International and Regional Organization, Members of the civil society, my fellow panel members, ladies and gentlemen, Nisan Bulavinaka and warm greetings from Fiji. In Fiji, sesamicity is most vigorous in the northern east part of the island. The last local tsunami occurred in Fiji in 1953 that incurred a localized earthquake offshore near Suva that killed five people. Regional tsunamis caused by remote earthquakes have struck Fiji with low frequency. However, we do know that despite low frequency, we will definitely experience massive destructions if it occurs. Therefore, early investment and preparedness is the key for us. Having said that, Fiji has substantially invested in early warning systems and policy interventions to prepare for tsunamis with the support of our development partners. We currently have 13 tsunami sirens installed along the Suva Peninsula with the support of the University of the South Pacific the New Zealand government, the European Union, and the Secretariat of the Pacific Community. An additional 26 sirens will be installed, extending from Suva Peninsula towards the western side of Viti Levu, covering majority of our coastal community. The selection of these siren sites was done with rigorous modeling on available data sets. Population density, low-lying communities, and high vulnerability to hazards were key indicators to the model to shape the locations of these new sites. The new initiative has been founded through the support of the Japanese government. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the government of Japan for their continuous support to Fiji, especially in the field of disaster risk reduction. This represents a cornerstone of international cooperation for DRR, which is more than just a moral obligation, but an essential requirement to build resilience for international community and planet together. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that disaster risk is only is always is also always associated with opacity and uncertainty. Thus, instead of coping with each risk individually, it is critical to construct a social system that has sufficient coping capacity against big scale disasters. And this is possible by establishing integrated strategies beforehand, setting priorities for disaster risk, systemizing the experience, and sharing information and lesson learned and knowledge of disasters with cooperation amongst the government agencies, businesses, and local communities. DRR requires a multi-hazard approach and inclusive risk-informed decision-making combined with enough advocacy on understanding risk associated with hazards and how to cope with it. While installing, while installation of early warning system is important for early action, educating people on how it serves, its purpose is no less. 
Fiji NDMO has been conducting awareness training for communities and private sectors together with tsunami drills in collaboration with our national counterparts, including the Fiji Mineral Resources Department. We also conduct operational checks of the tsunami siren on a monthly basis. This exercise is part of government's continued commitment towards improving its state of readiness for any tsunami event. In addition, installation of tsunami signage is in partnership with city councils and Fiji Roads authorities also undertaken to ensure visual awarenesses of tsunami safe zones and evacuation routes. Most hazards like tsunami need signs influenced to ensure safetyness of our vulnerable communities. Signs and policies needs to be integrated to allow timely evidence-based decision-making. Well-functioning science policies interface equates to dynamic ecosystem of organizational arrangements, institutionalized processes with access to modern methods of collecting and analyzing data, such as the use of remote sensing, satellite imagery, drones, and geographical information system. All this serves to structure the relationship of a diverse actors around complex policies to address a systematic risks. Finally, the resilience of our most vulnerable correlates with the timeliness and accuracy of the disaster information received and the urgency of a timely response and information sharing from national level to communities and vice versa. Only together, we can ensure that we make an impact, producing the ultimate behavioral change and mindset nationally and globally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Soko, for the insights you shared in your message. Let, let me now introduce our panel of experts from the field. We have with us uh, Mr. Ricardo Toro, who is Director of Chile's Office of National Emergencies, uh, Mr. Ronald Jackson, Head of the Disaster Risk Reduction Recovery for Building Resilience Team uh, at the UNDP, uh, Ms. Gina Bon, who is Chargé de Mission for Gender and Risk Reduction, the Indian Ocean Commission. And from Indonesia, we have uh, Dr. Nuraini Rahma Hanifa, who is Secretary General of You Inspire Alliance. Rahma is also junior researcher uh, at the Research Center for Geotechnology, National Research and Innovation Agency. And she is uh, the recipient of the award that Ambassador uh, Dr. Webster highlighted in her remarks earlier. Thank you all so very much for joining us uh, today. If we could start with you, please, Ricardo, if you could share with us your thoughts, key messages, on this World Tsunami Awareness Day. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks, Jax. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this important event. Uh, regard to all participants, and we are very all aligned with what has been said. I want to start highlighting how important the World Tsunami Awareness Day is for Chile. As a country highlights posed to this threat, we know the importance of tsunami preparedness and understand the value of preserving the memory of these events. In fact, the lesson we learned from 2010 milestone allow us to better cope this earthquake and tsunami in Iquique 2014, 8.2 magnitude, and Iyapel 2015, 8.3 magnitude. In this uh, context, I would like to briefly talk to you about two aspects that in our experience are highly relevant. Firstly, the international cooperation and partnership to improve capacities. And secondly, how we work with communities and, and young talents. In, in the case of Chile, international partnership and cooperation have demonstrated to be determinant in the way we conduct business. As an example, in 2012, we joined the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center Conference to discuss the relevance of uh, preventive evacuation. This has a direct impact on the definition and rules of our tsunami protocol until the present. But more significantly, it has a ripple effect over the other countries. After the implementation of our first tsunami protocol, the experience has been shared with different international services, always 
highlighting a baseline of coordination between organization and the procedures to carry out preventive evacuation. The concept was unprecedented at the time and had been considered for implementation in countries such as Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Also, Chile has participated in various pack weight exercises from 2012 to the present, which enabled us to improve our procedure for far field earthquake, the post tsunami threat over Chile. Additionally, after the implementation of the emergency alert system and some siren network, we have received inquiries from our international counterpart to learn more about technical and operational aspects of this early warning uh, system. Regarding the topic of effective partnership, two particular kind of engagement have demonstrated to work particularly well. Firstly, instant of dialogue between specialists and authorities in which both parties learn directly from their counterpart. This provides decision maker with an enhanced perspective when making quick and scientifically based decision to better address complex processes such as tsunami warning or active of evacuation on the coast. Second, the execution of simulation and drills at all levels confront local population, national authorities, and international partnership with their strengths and weakness. This is essential to identify concrete action that must be taken to facilitate rapid response, which is paramount to save life. In relation to how we work with communities and the youth as a country, we are aware that in order to be more resilient and integrated development of the system on any and the community is required, the later being one of the, our main focuses. As portrayed in the video Tsunami Girl, the 27F not only reveals flaws in the warning system, but also the need to advance in what we may call social early warning. From those lessons learned, we develop different programs and projects uh, whose ultimate goal is to safeguard people's lives, such as the case of the Community Emergency Response Team program or the recruitment of Mercalli informant for rapid assessment of the seismic event. Additionally, we carry out different preparedness and response activities for uh, Chilean youth, such as real focus on the education sector, training program for the young volunteers, and the training of evaluators for massive drill and simulation exercise on the coast line. These activities are not only necessary to reinforce the early warning system, but allow us to spread awareness and recruit young talent in both participatory and technically a proficient manner. At the present, we have developed a national policy and a new disaster prevention act that binds this element together by instituting this disaster risk management instrument and early warning system by law. Finally, I would like to reiterate the importance of the population knowing the risk to make their own time and timely decision which can be supported by an adequate early warning system, taking as a reference the experiences that the most advanced country in this matter share through international cooperation and adapting them to our own reality. We believe that space such as the Tsunami Awareness Day has an irreplaceable importance to generate genuine resilience through cooperation and to remind us year after year, that at any moment, this hazard can be active on the coast of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Uh, if we could now come to you, Ron, for your thoughts on uh, World Tsunami Awareness Day this year. Thank you very much, uh, Shax. Let me first recognize distinguished SRSG from, from UNDRR. Um, the head of UNESCO and excellencies who spoke earlier from Japan, Australia, um, and also to recognize the other nations who've partnered uh, for this event. I want to 
recognize the viewers and participants and to say that it is my pleasure to join with all of you today uh, to mark World Tsunami Awareness Day, to stand in solidarity for those who have lost their lives over the years as a result of this devastating event, but also to reflect a little bit on you know, the advances we've made so far, but where we can go. Um, you know, we've, we've heard many presentations allowing us to, to dream a little bit of what the future could be like. For us over the last few years, uh, UNDP has been a proud partner and co-organizer with the people of Japan and UNDR are on an event such as today's Marking World Tsunami Awareness Days. Day. With the eyes of the world on Glasgow, I hope that we can galvanize international cooperation in line with this year's World Tsunami Awareness Day theme to make every effort to build resilience and reduce risk to extreme climate and catastrophic disaster events. Allow me to just share three key message in terms of UNDP's support. Um, and certainly down the line, I'm, I'm happy to perhaps reflect on some of the programs and projects you'd have heard uh, mentioned by SRSG among others. My first message is that undoubtedly science and technology have significantly enhanced our knowledge of why tsunami occurs and how timely early warning can help save lives. In fact, for catastrophic events like tsunami, understanding the risk, taking proactive or early warning action can make the difference between life and death. Ever since the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, UNDP has partnered with various international and technical agencies to develop end-to-end -end tsunami and multi-hazard early warning systems. We must continue to invest in improving and maintaining such systems so that warnings are received at the earliest possible time to allow for early action. My second key message is that science and technology have to be adapted to local needs and be user-friendly and people-oriented. Local governments must be empowered and have capacities to interpret and act upon warnings, communicate them, and disseminate clearly instructions for evacuation and ensure that affected communities know where to go. The last mile connectivity is therefore equally important to enable action. For decades, UNDP has invested in community-based disaster risk management programs that aim to raise awareness of local governments and communities to multi-hazards, help them to map community vulnerabilities and to develop coping mechanisms and building their resilience. My third and final key message is, as we move towards a more digitalized world today, we must leverage these to prioritize the needs of the poorest, the most vulnerable, and the marginalized, so that no one is left behind. The impact of disaster events and the global pandemic on people with pre-existing vulnerabilities is particularly severe, as it is the poorest and the most vulnerable who continue to inhabit hazard-prone areas or engage in precarious livelihoods. In the last year and a half, UNDP has undertaken socioeconomic impact assessments and developed dashboards and data ecosystems that provide evidence towards addressing underlying risks and vulnerabilities in current and towards future development. Thank you, Shats, for, for allowing me to just say a few words and I look forward to the ongoing discourse. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. If we could come to you now, Gina, for your thoughts and key messages on this uh, important day. Thank, uh, good afternoon to all, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Sachs, for the, uh, for the opportunity. And um, from this side of the world, from the Western Indian Ocean Islands, um, commemorating the World Tsunami Day reminds us that disaster can strike our shores at any time, and we need to be prepared. From, um, we recall the 2004 tsunami, which was a wake up call for most of the islands of, in the coastal countries of East Africa. A few countries were affected, for instance, we, we can take uh, Seychelles, Madagascar, Madag um, Tanzania and Mauritius, they were they, they were um, from the tsunami, which resulted in loss of properties, lives, and other businesses. If we take Seychelles, for instance, uh, the damage were mainly to major infrastructures and the, infra the infrastructures along the coast, 
the fishing ports and the capital city, Victoria, was flooded. Before the event, the word tsunami was not known to our generation, to our population. It was, in the, it was not in the language of the common people. It was a word for the scientists and was considered as low risk to the region. If there has been any occurrence then, those were not properly, uh, maybe not properly documented or known to our people. But from that day on, things have changed. Much has been done and a, a lot of efforts has been put into um, in the early warning systems and preparing the region for a tsunami. As we speak, the risk is growing. The region is coming more vulnerable uh, due to the impact of climate change and activities of mankind. All the, uh, all the natural barriers which acted as wave breakers, such as mangrove forests, coral reefs, sand dunes, are slowly disappearing. And this is due to sea level rise and over exploitation of natural resources. For the island states, this is very important because we depend on the ocean on a, largely for, the eco, for our economy. And if we do not take action now to sustain what we have developed over the years, it will be very detrimental and costly to the population. We must also bear in mind that there are two active volcanoes in the region, one in uh, La Reunion Island and one in um, Comoros, the Cartala in Comoros. And we have learned recently from uh, information coming from, the, from Mayotte, which is an outer territory within the Indian Ocean region, that there are uh, volcanic seismic uh, um, activities developing. And this in itself is creating the risk. The risk is coming bigger. It is uh, if we take into, uh, we look at the geography of our region, we have the Seychelles Islands which is, with its uh, natural world heritage, which is at risk. We will have the whole uh, Northern coast of Madagascar, which might be affected. And again, we have to think of the Comoros itself. And these are these two islands, Madagascar and Comoros, the level of preparedness, although they have, Madagascar has a very good level of preparedness in terms of the cyclone, but I don't know how much they are prepared for the, the tsunami. So we have to take that into consideration as we move along. And what we need to do, uh, we think as island nations, we need to invest more and think Collectively, we cannot do it alone. We, uh, in early warning, we need to improve our early warning systems, and we will need to uh, to bring uh, education, put education and awareness in the schools in the front line. Because for for us, our schools are basically on the coast. We need to be able to be able to secure the lives of our children. We need to invest in technology. The technology they are not very cheap. But again, alone, we cannot do it. This is where regional cooperation and international collaboration is very much required. So I think that uh, where we are, where we stand at the moment, uh, this morning we had a very interesting um, discussions with the countries of the region. And again, we could see that the level of understanding or the level of knowledge about the tsunami is growing. They have, there's a lot that has been done and the med services are now working together with the disaster re uh, recovery or the disaster uh, management centers to try to improve their capacities. So I will stop here for the moment and I, I look forward to continue the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gina. If we could come to you now, Rahma, in Indonesia to get your thoughts uh, on this World Tsunami Awareness Day. Thank you, Ms. Sharks. Good morning and good evening, Excellencies, distinguished guests, and greeting from Indonesia. It is such an honor and pleasure to be invited in this distinguished forum. I would like to convey six key messages, as in Indonesia, my country, we have experienced so many surprising tsunamis with different characteristics at the local level. We experienced the 2004 Sumatra Andaman magnitude 9 earthquake with a very strong shaking followed by a giant tsunami, but contrary, the Java 2006 and Mentawai 2010 was a tsunami earthquake that have slow shaking but high tsunami. Then we have another surprising event in 2018, the Palu with super share strike slip through the Palu Bay compound with marine landslide with very rapid tsunami arrival of five minutes and flow liquefaction 
We also experienced the Krakatau 2018 volcanic tsunami with marine landslide. The different characteristic brings very different way of tsunami risk reduction strategy. So the first key message is the importance to understand each local characteristic of tsunami in our region. We have a lot of improvement on science and advanced technology, especially since 2004. Yet we still need a lot of detail and local researchers for our future homework. Second, local wisdom and knowledge that it passed through generation has played important role when it is remembered and practiced, such as Hmong in Simulu Island that have saved most of the Simulu Island people in 2004. We find many local terminology of tsunami from various coastal areas in Indonesia. However, local wisdom tend to decrease, such how we observed in Aceh and Palu. We have term of Bombatalu from Kaili indigenous people in Palu and Nalodo for the flow liquefaction. But only few people who remember and they survived. But most of the people just didn't know as my friend from Palu, she told me, how can I not know this can happen in my city? I was never aware and I was never thought that this can be happened. So we understand that even though we already have tsunami education and tsunami warning in place, but it is also still very crucial to understand how to self-evacuation. We need to have self-evacuation capability. This is the third key message, especially for a very near field tsunami with rapid time, rapid time arrival. And also we need to understand natural sign of tsunami, where to evacuate and simulate on a routine basis with together with younger generation. The fourth key, we see the crucial role of community-based tsunami risk reduction and tsunami ready with the leadership of local champion, either elder people, women, or young people. In my experience joining the National Tsunami Ready Expedition and discussion with some colleagues, we tend to feel that we know our community. We also tend to think we are justifiably representing the voice from the ground. But at one point, we should also ask, is this true? We need to hear more the voice of the local community. Fifth, women and young people are among them who can be the engine of the process. And it's really meaningful for us to hear that the many support and acknowledgement of young people and women as agent of acceleration in this high level forum. As we can see in the youth video message, we see that youth can bridge intergenerational gaps from research to practice and also to policy, solution producers, and youth are also close to the technology and innovation savvy. Young people are energetic on local actions. They can be part as building tsunami ready community. This is also what we can see from our network in New Inspire Alliance. Thank you for the acknowledgement to us. Fifth, sixth, International collaboration has provided opportunities for women, youth and young professionals on knowledge transfer, technology transfer, exchange of experiences, joint research and activities, and learning from communities from different countries, which enhance our understanding, opening our horizon for better preparedness. And it is also essential to have equal partnership. I benefited to have opportunities pursuing higher education in Nagoya University in Japan while raising two children. It was not easy, but I was really thankful for the opportunity given. I also experienced a 2011 earthquake, and I'm very grateful that uh, I can be connected with various international organizations, universities, and New Inspire Alliance friends in 12 country chapters. This year, we dive in a journey on future literacy, DRR future thinking, together with UNESCO, UNDRR, and UNDP Accelerator Lab on disaster risk, reduction, on disaster risk governance and disaster knowledge. We understand that a more fluid and uh, inclusive uh, knowledge together will also bring a future role for us because in 2030, 2045, we will be the one that keep all this uh, knowledge uh, passing through. I understand and believe that tsunami risk reduction is possible together with continuous learning effort and long-term commitment and leadership. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, uh, Rahma, uh, for your insights. Uh, if we could ask you all to please stay with us, uh, we are going to do a short uh, question and answer session after this. First, we're going to open the floor, though, uh, to uh, member states uh, and uh, the member from um, the Maldives, the representative from the Maldives, uh, would like to take the floor. Her Excellency uh, Huda Ali Sharif, the floor is yours. Thank you. I thank you all for your valuable participation to today's event, Observing the World Tsunami Awareness Day. International cooperation and partnerships are key for raising tsunami awareness and disaster risk reduction. This is the reason we decided to, to together to dedicate a day every year to tsunami resilience and readiness. When we established the World Tsunami Awareness Day six years ago, our hearts bore the memory of the hundreds of thousands of deaths caused by tsunamis over the last two decades. Us Maldivians remember the disasters of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami that hit almost all our islands. It affected more than 18 countries and killed over 250,000 people in one day. The ravages go even beyond its severe deadliness. Indeed, tsunamis also have catastrophic consequences on sustainable development, especially for low, low island states like the Maldives. In 2004, in a few hours, two thirds of our capital was flooded, submerging infrastructures and homes, causing buildings to collapse, electrocutions and explosions. In total, the tsunami cost the Maldives almost 62% of our country's GDP. Natural disasters have dramatic consequences, posing massive threats to assets and investments in sustainable development. It creates deep, deep health, environmental, financial, and psychological wounds to heal, taking up to two decades. Excellencies and dear colleagues, meeting today gives us an opportunity to remember, but also to anticipate. With sea levels rising due to the climate crisis, we must be more resilient when facing the increase in natural disasters. We have to be prepared, especially in the case of small islands, island developing states where evacuation is difficult. Working together can improve our global response and recovery to tsunamis. Through enhanced international cooperation, we can support the transfer and development of innovative technology, such as early warning systems and resilient infrastructure. Disaster risk reduction is an issue that can be tackled together. Listening to global experts and youth working in academia, engineering, science and technology helps us to develop our resilience for 2030. The Sendai framework focuses on the three dimensions of disaster risk in order to prevent the creation of new risk, reduce existing risk, and increase resilience. As outlined in the framework, we must develop integrated regional information network and share warning systems for common risky areas. Finally, our climate is an essential part of the conversation when talking about natural disasters. Despite being the, one of the lowest countries in the world, our atolls give the Maldives a natural protection against tsunamis, which was a strong asset in, in, in 2004, as well as the seawall that was built with the assistance of the Japanese aid. Protecting our environment is necessary to be resilient against natural disasters, as well as to prevent further increase in their frequency and strength. Excellencies and dear colleagues, we are presented today with an opportunity to learn better, to learn better, prevent, protect, and further collaborate on disaster risk reduction. We welcome and appreciate our conversations to head towards a more sustainable and prepared future. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Your Excellency. We are now uh, going to hand things over to Portugal's Deputy Permanent Representative, who would now like to take the floor. Uh, Mr. Eduardo Ramos, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the floor, and thank you for convening this meeting to mark the World Tsunami Awareness Day. Portugal, my country, is no stranger to such catastrophes. Our capital and my native city, Lisbon, grew out of the traumatic earthquake and tsunami of 1755 and became one of the first examples of urban planning in the modern era 
a century avant la lettre, as we say in French, which confirms that in every crisis there is opportunity. Still today, we continue to work in our preparation efforts. In 2017, we increased our national capabilities by hosting the tsunami warning system for the Northeast Atlantic, thereby enabling us to join collective efforts such as the UNESCO-sponsored Global Tsunami Warning System. Also, as you may know, Portugal will host together with the UNDDR uh, in partnership with the European Commission and the Council of Europe in 2001, European Forum, Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction from 24th to 26th November next. This event will bring together 55 member states, stakeholders and partners from Europe and Central Asia, fully focused on how to think and act differently to build resilience and reduce the risk of disasters. Lastly and more broadly, Portugal is committed to the promotion of a better government of the ocean and the sustainable use of its resources. That's why we are looking forward to co-hosting with Kenya the second United Nations Ocean Conference in June 2022. We hope that it will produce a truly impactful, action-oriented outcome with a strong political commitment towards the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean as per SDG 14, but also one that's trend-setting in finding concrete solutions to ocean's problems through science and innovation. I thank you very much for your attention and your time. Very much, uh, Mr. Ramos. And now, uh, Sergio Castellari from uh, the permanent mission of Italy to the United Nations would like to take the floor. Mr. Castellari, you have the floor. Thanks. Thanks, Excellency and distinguished colleagues, and thanks to the organizer of this timely event. Yeah, I would like to make a short reflection about the importance of the partnership and collaboration at the scientific and technical level in the Euro-Mediterranean region uh, for tsunami uh, prevention. So Italy established in 2013 the National Tsunami Alert Center at the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology, INGV, and it became fully operational in 2017. And this center is a, a tsunami service provider of the network coordinated by UNESCO, the Northeastern Atlantic, Mediterranean and Connected Sea Tsunami Warning System. And this center sent message to many countries in all the Euro Mediterranean area. Uh, last September, Italy also launched a new innovative probabilistic tsunami forecasting model. It's very important to update the models to be always ready with the best available science to make a good early warning system for tsunami. And furthermore, uh, since 2020, this uh, Italian center for tsunami is also involved in the Tsunami Ready Program, which is uh, recommended by UNESCO as one of the leading theme of the awesome decade 2021-2030. So today, Italy with INGV also organized many different multimedia events, scientific events to, for this important day for Tsunami Awareness Day. So today, for example, Italy with the, the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology organized an international tabletop exercise to show the potentiality of the urgent computing for rapid post-event assembly. So they, they reproduce an early warning system of the past case of a magnitude seven uh, Samos earthquake, which produced last year a moderate but damaging tsunami in the Eastern Mediterranean. Another initiative of today of, the, uh, of Italy is also the creation of an online in English and Italian story map about all the tsunami events in the Mediterranean basin from 365 AD up to the present. So let me conclude with a question and the importance of linkage also climate change and tsunami. So we know that the common challenge is enhancing the resilience to coastal other being meteorological floods, coastal erosion due to sea level rise or tsunamis. The ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction and the natural-based solution, for example, <clears throat> conserving and restoring coastal forests like mangroves have been proven to be able to provide several benefits, not only to climate change adaptation and resilience, but also to climate change mitigation and uh, ecosystem conservation and restoration. So this ecosystem-based approach uh, for tsunami can be also integrated with technological solutions to produce hybrid solution. So the challenge now is to bring uh, such a natural-based solution and the hybrid solution, in particular for the developing countries, to scale up and to do so fast. I recall that Italy contributed this year uh, with more than 30 million of euro to the adaptation fund. So my question is, uh, which are the key actions that the public and the private sector can do for a fast scale up of MBS and hybrid solution for the developing country to reduce the tsunami risk? 
So thanks uh, again for the opportunity for uh, to join this fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are now going to hand the floor over to Councillor Lee Bang Mu of uh, the Republic of Korea Mission. Are uh, you there, Councillor? Thank you, Madam Facilitator. Um, on behalf of the Republic of Korea Mission, we thank the permanent mission of Chile, Fiji, Japan, Maldives, Australia, Indonesia, Norway, and Peru, UNDRR, UNDP, and UNESCO for co organizing today's precious event. And our gratitude also goes to the speakers and panelists for their very helpful opinions. It has been more than a decade since the Tohoku tsunami and the Indian Ocean tsunami broke out, but we will never forget the disasters. We express our deepest condolence to the victims and their families of the devastating disasters. WTAD has contributed as a wake up call to the importance of systematic preparedness, rapid response, inclusive recovery and international cooperation for tsunami and other disasters as well. We believe regional cooperation for disasters is very important as it is possible to provide prompt and effective assistance because of similar disaster experiences and geographical proximity. In that sense, the Republic of Korea has been making various efforts to strengthen disaster cooperation with Northeast Asia and ASEAN countries, and will actively contribute to the disaster risk reduction in the region and beyond. We look forward to seeing you all at the regional platform in Australia and the global platform in Indonesia next year. I thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lee. Uh, if you have any further queries, uh, comments, insights, uh, please email UNDRRCOMS, C O M M S, at UN.org. Again, that's uh, UNDRRCOMMS at uh, UN.org. Uh, for any further queries, uh, questions, comments you might have. You can also check out HTTPS, uh, and that's colon forward slash IOC.UNESCO.org. Again, that's IOC.UNESCO.org. And now, uh, His Excellency, the Permanent Representative of Japan, Ambassador Kimihiro Ishikane, will deliver his closing remarks for us. Ambassador, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking all the speakers and panelists for their contributions uh, to this event. And I thank you uh, for the condolences and sympathies expressed to the tsunami that happened before. I think today's event has clearly demonstrated uh, determination to prevent future tsunamis, disasters, and protect people uh, through the use of science and technology. In this regard, uh, we cannot uh, stress enough the importance of science and technology in policy and decision-making. Well, uh, for example, as discussed uh, at today's meeting, uh, we are seeing emerging new technologies uh, that will allow us to predict tsunamis in advance more accurately than ever. Uh, prior investment in anticipation of future tsunamis, including uh, in the development of early warning systems that make best use of available technologies, is uh, really essential. Um, today, we have also heard the powerful voices of young people. Yes, very impressive. Passing down the memories of the past tsunamis and the lessons from, uh, learned from generation to generation is key to preventing future disasters and creating a more resilient society. Uh, we should continue to listen to the youth, you know, the boys and the girls, and, as well as to the elderly, and think about how we can further work together, taking advantage of the occasion of World Tsunami Awareness Day. One important point that was brought up today was the linkage between climate change and tsunami. Research shows the intensifying climate uh, change and rising sea levels exacerbate tsunamis. 
we should think of tsunamis and other disasters not in silos but in a holistic manner taking into account various uh, interrelated social and environmental issues and i would like to use this opportunity to reiterate japan's commitment to mainstreaming disaster risk reduction japan hosted the past three u.s conferences on disaster risk reduction and has been actively promoting the implementation of the Sendai framework. And in this connection, the midterm review of the Sendai framework in 2023 will be a crucial moment to further develop the framework. Japan will continue to be at the forefront of international cooperation and disaster risk reduction. Of course, this is a you know, uh, challenge we need to face, all of us, not only government and the private sector included, but as uh, the representative for Ita Italy uh, put it, how we, the private sector could be brought into play in this uh, challenge is something we need to really work on. Finally, I would like to conclude my remarks by extending my appreciation to all participants here today and the course posters once again. I thank you. Ambassador Ishikane, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all our distinguished participants and all of you who have joined us online today. We hope we have provided food for thought and encouragement for how tsunami risk reduction can progress during the UN uh, Ocean Decade. Thank you once again and goodbye. There's something like 650 million people on the coast within 10 meters of the coastline. So as you imagine, that's a lot of communities. So if we are going to have 100% of our communities tsunami ready over the next decade, we've got to work together. To move from tens of communities that understand what needs to be done to the 100% of communities that we identify that need this help and communities will be able to help themselves when there is a warning. And to be ready the best way is to practice, is through an exercise. These exercises are international exercises, but all our countries participate. And so what that does, it gives the, every community in that country the opportunity to, to practice and actually get ready for the next tsunami. So the international cooperation is at the core of the tsunami warning and mitigation system in all levels. But at the same time, we need a way to tell everyone that there's a tsunami coming. That's about, for example, the telecommunications industry, the internet, fiber optic cables that go undersea, on the satellites. How do we make sure they uh, reach our most remote communities in a reliable way and at a low cost way?